far, but lesson one, right? Okay, so what is language? And um, this really kind of also covers a little bit about what the course is about. We won't spend time on the syllabus again, but uh, kind of a, an understanding too of how this is different from the sentiment course. So I know a lot of people have taken that, but we also lifted the restrictions where people didn't have to have that one first because to me these are two totally different silos of people um, where data science can merge them together. So 520 is really about sentiment and natural language processing in Python. This course is computational linguistics with a cognitive science focus because that's my background. Um, and so we're going to talk really about how we deal with language. Language is very messy. And this idea transcends, um, let me make sure this is turned off, great. Um, this idea transcends both courses, right? So uh, text is inherently messy. We won't totally get into processing and cleaning data. This is m more going to be about what do I do with the data that I have? So I have categorical data, what can I do? I have half and half, what can I do instead? Um, first half of the semester is going to focus on things that are kind of familiar, like regression and logistic regression. Then the second half of the semester is probably things you've never seen or heard of before, which is the goal. Um, and those analyses, I must say, a lot of about interpretive dance. And what I mean by that is that um, we're going to move away from p-values and statistical testing and move into descriptive analyses. So building models of and uh, pictures of the data and what that tells us that we can then maybe do you know, ANOVA on later. Um, so I really wanted this course to not be just um, ANOVA and t-tests applied to language. Instead, it's here's some cognitive topics, some understanding of the theoretical background to these pieces, and then here's how you can apply that to your work. Because I think it's handy or helpful if you understand what the scientists are doing that lead you to doing these analyses. So you may never run a research project, but at least you understand why um, we're interested in bigrams. And all this is going to be an R. The textbook is very cheap if you want it. Uh, you can survive without it as well, but I think it's a really nicely written book um, meant for people who have kind of never done this before. Uh, I know a lot of you have already had R before, um, but it does assume you know a little bit about linguistics. So I'm going to fill in those gaps. And then all of the assignments are in Markdown. I think making reports is something that analytics or data science people are like, that's the number one thing that you spend most of your time doing is writing code to run an analysis to compile a report for your boss or your or a journal or whoever. Um, so we're going to make those reports in Markdown. Uh, so all the assignments are in Markdown, all the notes are in Markdown because practice what you preach, right? And you will um, knit those to HTML to submit for me. So you get a little bit of practice on presenting your work as well. And so what am I going to learn? What is computational linguistics? Like, what is it that I do? And what is language processing? And how can we analyze data? How do we take qualitative data? Language is inherently qualitative because it's not literally a number. And apply statistics to that. Um, and then what are popular ways that we can measure language association and model human language? Because in, in, in essence, I would say a, a lot of linguistic research or human language research is about the inherent associations that are in the data. So how do we know that people know that the structure of language in English anyway should be noun, verb, noun? What, this is, this is something you know. You just I've learned it somehow, or you're born with it, if you want to go with the Chomsky view. Um, but like, how do we know that people know that? And so that's an association question. And how do we model that sort of thing? Hint, there's a lot of ways. So we'll talk about um, several different approaches to the same question. All right, so you should look at the syllabus. And we've kind of talked about it twice now. Um, it has been updated. We're going to use Moodle for everything course related now that I've got it mostly updated and normally this is where I'd stop and do that but we did this on Saturday so we'll move on from that okay. uh, you are expected to write reports with code and text embedded 
Um, and so I think my big thing, and I went over this Saturday, like I said, was to just make sure you answer all the questions. So we'll look at that first assignment after we're finished with the lesson and just kind of make sure you understand like how to do that. Um, you will want to include your sources. This is mainly for the final project. And mostly try to use APA style. So you can you look at Purdue's Owl for tips on APA style or a knight site. And that's knight, like knight in shining armor. Um, it's a really great website that also does APA style. So let's get into the real stuff here. So um, some things to think about. If I think about language, uh, to me, language is amazing. It's this thing, this is why I study it. Like, it's this thing that we do that um, seems so natural until things go wrong. Um, and, uh, or until you learn a second language, many of you are bilingual or multilingual, and so you can attest to, like, realizing the difficulty of L, um, what's called L2 or language two. Um, and, uh, but if I just think about my native language, and the last thing that I said to someone, right? it was me texting my husband that the dishes were clean and the dishwasher as a hint, right? Put, it up, put away the dishes. Right? Um, the last thing I wrote down was a reminder to myself to enter the executive weekend dates. Right? And so this scribble hopefully will make sense later. And as I've been un unpacking, I've had a good laugh at myself thinking I'm going to remember what all of my little codes meant on the on the labels on my boxes because it's been six months since I've seen this stuff and I'm like, what is this code, right? So um, sometimes language fails us because we don't um, remember why we said something. Okay. Last thing you heard, uh, fortunately, it's me, unfortunately, right? So, um, or maybe your favorite TV show or your animals barking at you. Um, <clears throat> But it's just sort of amazing if we think about how exactly we did all of these things. Okay. So humans are cognitive processors. Um, we'll compare the brain a lot to a computer. But then we also have all of the systems here in the throat. So the reason that we have language and animals don't in the same capacity is um, often just due to basic biology of the way our vocal cords and larynx are structured. Um, and we'll cover just a very little bit on how human language is um, different from animal language and that we are creative creatures. Okay. But then creativity is a big problem for analyzing language. So the things that make us human also make it difficult to analyze. So we have some biological pieces that allow us to speak. So we've got um, some brain areas. You don't have to know these, they're just interesting, but we've got um, which one's in the front? Broca's. Broca's is here in the front, close to your temple. It's generally on the left side, unless you're left-handed. Um, and it does uh, planning and execution of language. It's very close to the area of the brain that uh, controls motor movements. Back here towards your ear, um, kind of behind your ear, is Wernicke's area. This area controls understanding of speech. It's very close to the speech areas of the brain. So, and then there's this huge connection system between them. So people who study um, neurolinguistics um, uh, examine those pathways and try to understand how that works. All of that made possible by the way that our mouth and tongue are shaped. Um, and so when I teach this course in a more traditional setting and not like an analytic setting, we spend a lot of time talking about the phonetic alphabet and how one speaks, right? And then our larynx system. But if we abstract a little away from the physical brain, we are inherently symbol processors. So the squiggles on the page don't actually mean anything. We have assigned them meaning. And so uh, if we think of language as a symbol system, it now gets a lot easier to think about how to analyze it in a, um, in a straightforward way. Uh, so we are symbol processors. Uh, and then for most languages, word order is the number one prescriptor of understanding. So we know that if I say John hit Mary, John is doing the hitting because he came first in the sentence. Um, social key aspects to language um, is our knowledge of others. Uh, the social rules of what I can and can't say in each sentence are each setting. It's called pragmatics. 
attitudes. Um, and for me, this is really interesting because uh, this is where culture gets really inter gets really um, embedded in what you are and aren't allowed to say. Um, I'm a misplaced Southerner. I'm from Texas, and uh, there are many times that I'm speaking to people up here in the North, and I'm just like, give me a break, right? I would never have said that. <laughs> um, so there are definitely these in inherent social rules that we might study and deal with on a daily basis. And that leads me to like, what is the purpose of language? Why do we have this? So this is the sort of meta question of why. And if you read the literature or just ask people, what's the purpose of language? This one comes up first. Okay. And so if we're thinking about this in an evolutionary standpoint, communication is important. And um, uh, that helped save us from predators, helped us find where no where food is. And then if we get to now, obviously we're in a, an, an age where communication is pervasive, right? We've got the social media and our phones and the, this kind of this kind of thing where we can interact. We're not in the same place. Um, and so communication uh, and language has like kind of multiplied. But on a basic level, communication is the purpose of language. But we also see people doing emotional expressions when people write or write poetry or sing. Um, there's often a lot of emoting going on. Uh, body language falls into this category too sometimes. Um, but emotional expression is a communication, so these are not separate things. Uh, social interaction, because humans um, pretty much necessitate social interaction, it appears to be part of our basic psyche. Um, something that we need for positive mental health. And then you can also just think, so thinking to yourself. Um, and then there's always this moment when you, have, when you realize that there's no reason that you think in words, right? And then um, whatever your native language is, so for me that's English, there's no reason that I should think in English. Right? It is literally just neurons firing in my head, but I have overlaid this structure on it. So, um, I think the hardest thing to get over when you study this stuff is realizing that the symbols, the words, usually don't really matter. Right? They are um, applied, and we'll talk about specific symbols, but um, they, in theory, are, are meaningless. We've, we've given them meaning, but this is the idea that rose by any other name would still smell sweet, that famous phrase. Um, so symbols are abstract is what I'm trying to say. So getting into studying this, um, you could be a linguist. Okay. And so traditional linguistics, and this is definitely changing, but traditional linguistics is the study of a language. Um, you might study syntax, which is the word or uh, the, the structure of the language. You might study morphology, which is looking at the little pieces of words. Uh, I have a friend that studies phonology, um, which is the sounds that go with words. And often this was done in like an English setting or an anthropology kind of setting where people were um, explaining how a language worked or di documenting a language. So eth uh, eth ethnography, eth eth ethnography, I don't know where the accent on that word goes, um, where uh, you find a new culture and a new language and you maybe um, help them create a writing system. So I have a, a colleague I used to work with who um, worked with a native tribe, Papua New Guinea, don't quote me on this, um, in helping them develop a writing system for their language. Um, psycholinguistics, so I always tell people I'm, I do computational linguistics because I, I feel like I am a data scientist um, and that kind of distinguishes itself from psycholinguistics, but I'm not sure that those two things are totally separate anymore. Um, but it's the, the understanding of the psychological processes involved in language. Sometimes people call this cognitive linguistics um, because I don't know how you do things without thinking about the cognitive system because that's the thing that's producing the language. Um, but this is more about thinking about the users of the system and how their um, social and cognitive abilities interact with producing language. Um, computational linguistics is sort of like cognitive science, linguistics, and computer science all merged together. 
So these are using neural net systems and um, uh, there's kind of a wide variety of types of people here, but um, building models from more of a, the brain is a computer kind of, kind of focus. And then there's even more names for these fields. So to me, this is such a cool area to be in because we are cross-sectional, right? So my degree is technically in cognitive science, but I have definitely moved into computational linguistics and people who run psycholinguistics definitely are normal linguistics as well. So we've kind of all kind of merged together. Um, and it's just a big field of people studying language. And so that's what, we need a better name for this <laughs> so that we're not in these little groups like, oh, you do computational linguistics? Well, I'm a traditional linguist. Like none of that really matters anymore because um, we can all work together. Uh, <clears throat> but if I give you guys, but is my word tonight, I'm sorry. So if I give you guys a, a, a rubric for what, what is language, right? So uh, it's a set of symbols. Uh, it doesn't matter what those symbols are. So uh, many, I have many students of Chinese. Obviously, you have a different set of symbols for your, for your written language. Right? Um, and there's Cyrillic. That is very different um, set of symbols. And a set of rules as well. I'm not sure if I understand your comments, but sure. <laughs> I, yes. Yeah, so no, communication is definitely the number one thing the language is for. Um, and then we also have to think about like, what pressures there are in language and we'll kind of get into this of how um, in the next couple of weeks of like how language shifts over time there's some really cool um diachronic motion graphs we're going to make uh, at the end of the semester that where you can watch language move it's really neat and looking at um at the idea that language isn't static and I mean, you guys hopefully know this because there have been words that have been invented in your lifetime. So anytime a, a word enters the lexicon, you can tell that language isn't static. Right? Like hangry is definitely one of my favorites. Uh, so what is language? Set of symbols? Set of rules? Well, we'll talk about both this semester. Um, so some basic terms that you should know that will help you throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, semantics. This is near and dear to me because this is my area, but it's the study of meaning. So I look at building models that um, and methodologies that allow us to understand word meaning better and how people know that words are mean the same thing or not. Uh, there's also syntax. So we're going to use syntax and grammar interchangeably and my linguistics instructor will probably shoot me. but. For our purposes, it's the, the rule-based system. Um, people do think that these are slightly different. <clears throat> Look at morphology, which is the study of individual words and their components. Pragmatics is the study of language use, so social pressures and all. And then the lexicon is really our mental dictionary. So then we're getting into word storage, like how, how are words stored in the brain? How do we know what they mean? How do we know how they transform? If, if there's no real like hardware in the brain, how are we doing this? And so that brings me kind of into a history. I think this is really neat. So um, if we look at the study of language across time. Uh, before and around 1900. Now, I'm taking this from a psychology perspective, I will say that. So somebody who's a traditional linguist is going to have a slightly different view of the history of language. But from the psychologist's perspective, um, Galton and Freud, Galton was really looking at language associates. Freud was doing this sort of hidden meaning and mental health, um, although poorly, um, in, the, in 1900, a little before and around that time. But the field as we know it today really started in the 1950s. So we are a baby research field, if you will, because, um, you know, bio study biology is very old. But at the time, we just didn't have the capacity or capability um, as computational linguistics to, to really do our work because computing was 
you know, nearly impossible without these machines that we have. So there's a super famous cognitive science conference, uh, one at Dar Car Cornell, one at Dartmouth, that um, in, at one of them they displayed the first room-sized computer uh, that was available for kind of computing things, and then they just really like cognitive science people got together and were like, we gotta do, we gotta do things, and so it revolutionized the field. Um, Chomsky, Chomsky is still around doing things, um, is a very famous linguist. Most people consider him the father of modern linguistics. Um, we kind of claim him too as psychologists. Uh, Skinner was a behaviorist, which meant that he didn't really believe in any of this brain activation stuff. And they had a very famous set of debates where Skinner wrote a book, The Analysis of Verbal Behavior. Chomsky thought it was crap, so he came out and laid into him. And Skinner came back and laid into him, and they went kind of went back and forth, so kind of an academic cat fight, if you will. Um, but it really got people thinking, people chose sides too, but it really got people thinking about, oh, I got to think about this language thing. And I can think about it from the perspective of that it's innate and built in, or I can think about it that it's learned and, abstra and um, abstracted, or maybe it's somewhere in the middle, it's a little bit of both. So most people believe it's a little bit of both. There are innate components, but there are also things that are learned. <clears throat> And then as we move into the 80s and the computer, computers become more prevalent up to now where, you know, we have incredible processing computers that sit on your desktop, like the laptop that I have, um, cloud services, uh, um, supercomputers is the phrase I'm going for here, but things with lots and lots of processing speed, uh, we get uh, the field of artificial intelligence becomes quite large. Uh, the ability to compute becomes easier and easier. And just uh, thinking about modeling, like thinking about suggesting that the human brain is essentially a complex computer. And if we apply that analogy, we can now really um, begin to think about how to model the brain. Yes, GPUs. Thank you. Um, so all these fields are now cross-pollinating. Like, I would say it's difficult for me. So forever in 100 years, I was afraid of the phrase machine learning. Like, who, what is that? I don't want any of that. That sounds scary and hard. And then now as I'm doing some reading, I'm like, oh, this is regression on steroids. Okay. And so I think a lot of our fields are doing very similar things and thinking about things in similar ways. We just don't realize it. Okay. <clears throat> So a couple more um, language terminology pieces. Now we're getting more into the weeds. Um, so a phoneme is a basic unit of sound. So friends that study phonetics. This is really important for speech recognition systems. Um, and it was funny because I went yesterday uh, and did, did this presentation on, on statistics. And I was talking to the um, lead researcher afterwards, and he was like, you know, when you're talking, I didn't really hear it, but now just talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, I could tell you're from the South. And I was like, what gave me away? And so we ended up talking about phonemes um, and nasals. So most Southerners have a drawl, and it goes through the through the nose. And my really bad one is to say like things like rat, so that nasal I sound. And so people who study phonetics look at those small sound components to language. And why you should care, if you're into this, uh, is speech recognition. This is why Siri sometimes is so funny, um, because uh, capturing dialect can be very difficult. So we'll do a, a lecture on dialect to get into phonemes. And that leads me into the many-to-many -many problem. <clears throat> so the many-to-many -many problem is, uh, this is true of any language, but I know it's true in English, so I'm going to tell you about how it works. Um, uh, where we have English is especially stupid and so I say this in my um, sentiment class but this class is true as well there will be a lot of moments we'll talk about how dumb English is because it's kind of a dumb language the joke is that English is three different languages in a trench coat pretending to be one language right um, and so one of the biggest problems is that uh, sound is spelling rules so if I say fish photo cough and puff that's four different ways to write one phoneme, the F sound. So P, uh, P, H, G, H, um, sorry, G, H, F, 
FF fish fish F <laughs> um, and then also the F sometimes is a V sound <clears throat> and so there are many spellings for one sound okay? but then there are also many sounds for one spelling so this is the read versus read idea um, wind versus wind so it's called the many-to-many -many problem because there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between sound and spelling and so uh, you see this in vowels and consonants. Uh, consonants are a little easier because they tend to be a bit more structured. Vowels are the weird things that we do. So A, E, I, O, U, and then Y. Um, and then the way those are voiced, the way they're spoken, also plays a role. We go up a level, we've got syllables. These are the rhythmic units of speech. So they're the, the accents that we put on words that help us understand what the word is. Um, so that's why it was hard. It was like, is it ethno ethnography, right? <laughs> Where does the accent in that word go? Because ethnography doesn't make any sense. Um, morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning, so I'm still getting bigger. Phonemes are the, the smallest sound pieces. Syllables are the, the, the chunks that have accents. Morphemes are a unit of meaning. And so this, do I have an example? No. <clears throat> um, if I think about the word cats, okay, multiple furry animals, cat is a single morpheme because that interpret is a meaning. It's the, the obnoxious mind is thankfully off doing something else right now because um, he's normally <laughs> like meowing and being obnoxious during these. But um, that is a single word. And then the S is also an informative unit of meaning, meaning more than one. So talk a little bit about morphemes later in the semester. And then all the way at the top, we have words, which are the smallest element in isolation. We can describe words in two different ways. We can talk about types and tokens. Tokens are the total number of words in a text. Types are the number of distinct words in a text. So this allows you to talk about diversity in a text. So the types to tokens ratio allows me to calculate <clears throat> um, how diverse the text is. So generally texts are not terribly diverse because we don't want to alienate our audience, but things like textbooks where they're um, presenting lots of new terminology to you would be pretty diverse. <laughs> Hopefully this is obvious, but just to tell you a little bit about what words can be, um, they can be nouns. Adjectives, right? So words that describe nouns. Verbs, which is the actors in the sentence. Adverbs that modify the action. Determinants are things like a and the, so they're filler words in the sentence. Pronouns, which are replacements for nouns. Prepositions of, into, right? and then conjunctions and but. So we have a lot of different um, roles that words can fill. So uh, later in the semester, I'm going to talk a lot about grammatical slots, and these are the, the uh, what the words do in a sentence. And it's usually tied to part of speech. What that can, what that will let us do is make these cool tree diagrams. And we won't spend a lot of time doing these because um, that's more of a, a natural language processing question on how to build these things and what they mean for the understanding of a text. Um, but uh, knowing that you can make these things will allow us to think about how do we analyze them. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about tree diagrams, but know that that's more of a uh, 520 kind of analysis of uh, building these things. So phrases are groups of words. And then I want to briefly touch on why human language is weird. So Hockett is this famous researcher who was trying to discern the separations between what is human language and what is not. So we can apply this to animals, mostly some um, comparison point, but you can also think about this as computer systems. So why is, okay, not R, R is not a good language, but why is, uh, what's a good one? C++, why is that not a language right, in the way that we think about language? Um, so there are commonalities between languages, 
Um, so even if you uh, attest to the Tower of Babel idea of that languages are diversified, there are lots of common core elements that make things a language that separate it from other communication systems, such as computer languages or animal language systems. <clears throat> and there's like 12 or 15 of these. I want to talk about my favorite ones. Uh, the big one that's important for what we're going to do in this class is semanticity. The symbols themselves, although they're abstract, have a meaning. And if we, can, if, we, if we think the symbols are meaningless, then why are we spending all of our time analyzing them, right, for, for understanding? So the symbols have to have some sort of meaning for our analyses to be informative. Um, they are arbitrary, though. So the, there's a, a theory that's called onomatopoeia. That's the idea that human language started as a as a representation of uh, the noises that things make. Um, so bark, right? Uh, bark does not actually sound totally like the noise that animals make when they bark. Maybe ref might be better. Um, but that theory doesn't hold a lot of water because what is truth, right? So arbitrariness means that the, the symbols themselves are, do not prescribe the meaning. Um, They're not uh, inherently meaningful. We give them meaning. Things are discrete, so symbols can be broken down and recombined using morphemes or grammatical rules. Uh, discreteness also implies that we can have this conversation today and the next week and be like, you remember that thing we talked about last week? Um, and then what used to be called creativity is now called productivity, but we can create and understand novel text. This is the biggest problem for, uh, the two big problems for um, natural language processing that computational linguistics actually tries to solve. Okay. So humans are, we are creative with language. Animals are not, and computer, science, computer languages are definitely not creative, right? They're not writing their own structure. Um, if they are, we're, we're getting into some really cool AI that I've not heard of, right? Um, <clears throat> But there, there's a creative use of language. We can say things no one has ever said before. Um, I've given this lecture I don't know how many times, and it's different every single time. Right? Um, and we, you guys can mostly understand what's happening, right? So it's not um, like if you're writing a system that's processing syntax, and often they'll fail when they hit new words. Right? But we don't as humans. So. Why is this course in an analytics class, right? So why isn't this course really more just like cognitive stuff, right? And so this used to be a very qualitative skill set. You would get large bodies of text and you would read them and interpret it. It would be like reading tea leaves. Right? Um, but now uh, we can really move away from that sort of um, subjective analysis. And so any statistics that were presented were very simple percentages or means, right? So statistics was this kind of dirty word in linguistics um, because what does that got to do with us, right? We study language. And that's uh, really tied to the understanding of what we thought language did and its purpose and what it was. So if it's innate, meaning it's biologically built in, and part of it is, all humans have the same underlying system and so as long as we can understand the system, um, we can then therefore understand all of the outputs. And so we would study the system, so a lot of biology, um, and look at the outputs so we can discern these rules that sort of apply to humans. Um, and we just have to kind of figure out what that system is. And there's a lot of really good work here, but uh, a lot of uh, this new wave of researchers and generally called statistical language learning. Um, and one of the articles for today's lecture is the argument that we are statistical processors. We're little mini Bayesians. Um, and our interaction with the environment really cannot be ignored. Okay. So if we kind of ignore the fact that people speak different languages, there's still a component that is clearly tied to you where you are and where you grew up, right? So there's that, always that like, uh, longing for home in a sense. Um, and so when I talk about being a misplaced southerner, part of that is linguistically 
So I had, a, this is a very silly example, but it's a good one. Um, when I would travel a lot, I have to remind myself to not ask for a Coke because I would get literally a Coke. And um, I really didn't really want a Coke. I wanted probably a Diet Coke or Dr. Pepper or Sprite or something else. In the South, if you go home, if you go, if I go home and I ask for a Coke, um, they'll be like, what kind? As confused as people, you can tell when they're not from the South because they'll be like, uh, a Coke. Like, why'd you ask me? But most of them will be like, oh yeah, I want a Dr. Pepper. Because like, I grew up close to the Dr. Pepper bottling plant, so yeah, we were, we were partial to it. Um, <clears throat> and so when I would travel, I'd have to remind myself to ask for a soda. Because then, I'm like, what soda do you have? And then I could say which one I wanted. Um, or I could ask for a pop, but that's just, like, sounds weird to me. So that's a very simple example about how culture and language interact. There are much broader um, examples, but you just can't ignore that stuff. It's there. Right? Um, and so our linguistic knowledge is shaped by our use of the language. Right? A very strong version of this theory is called linguistic determinism. And this is the idea of Eskimos have more words for snow. Most people don't believe that's really true. It's the idea of linguistic... Um, Oh, there's a there's collectivism. There's another phrase for it that's that's a little bit softer. Like we have this um, basic language innateness, and uh, the structure maybe is varied by culture and by use, but it's not um, determined by use. So, if we now think from this new perspective that we're intuitive statisticians then language is a statistics problem. And here we are. <laughs> so that's the purpose of this course, is thinking about language as a statistics problem and not um, a qualitative um, uh, thematic problem. All right. So what are the most important predictors of language work? And you, this, at the beginning of the semester, that's all we're going to talk about is frequency. Uh, if we're intuitive statisticians, what we're intuiting is the word frequency. So frequency of co-occurrence. Um, so these are called colexemes. Um, frequency just in use, prior probabilities. Like frequency is a big, big deal. I always joke with students, if you don't know the answer on a test, guess frequency. Because <laughs> you're probably right. right? And there's also many cognitive mechanisms that occur in our surroundings. So there's also developmental concerns. Um, there's a really famous case called Jeannie. Uh, it's a, actually more about abuse, right? So she was essentially locked in a closet for many years and not spoken to and um, didn't really learn language at the level that we are all um, speaking it. And there's a really great documentary about Jeannie. Oh, I think it's on YouTube. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, it's very sad. We'll warn you. Um, but that... That unfortunate case allowed us to think about um, the implications of social interaction and cognitive mechanisms. And what we will get to a lot of is the probabilistic structure of categories. So categories are things like dog, cat, animal, and um, they have a strong statistical influence on the way we think. And um, socially, there are different representations of word meaning. So there's prior probabilities of which word is likely in an ambiguous sense. Uh, we learn new words in our own lifetime. So hangry is my, my favorite of the new words. Um, and often these are slang. So English, one of its biggest issues is that it's an idiomatic language, meaning we mostly speak in idioms. Words don't directly represent what they mean. We kind of have these like side meanings for them. This makes it different, difficult for people who are uh, second language learners because uh, we're mostly speaking in slang. Okay. Um, so that's one of the reasons English is dumb. One of the many. I'm partial. Okay. So what we're going to cover this semester is how to model word choice. Uh, this is in a couple weeks. We're going to talk a lot about corpora and the availability of large bodies of text that have really revolutionized this field. 
or like a behavioral profile. So essentially making like a psychological profile of a single word. My favorite set of weeks is the semantic vector space models. This is where my research lies. And they really, to me, provide a, na a nice alternative to some of the NLP processing. Um, and then we could also use T-Test and ANOVA. There's nothing wrong with them. They're great tools. So getting into the stats part of this now, let's, let's see what we can do. So we, you guys have already, um, unless you weren't there this weekend, you have already done this. But I will brief, very briefly cover this stuff again. So you will need to use R for this course. I think over the weekend I got a good feel that we have a pretty good, pretty good um, structure for R. We won't do a whole lot of tidyverse. Um, that was all in tidyverse. But if you ever have an R-related question of like, what is this code? Definitely just let me know. But I do assume you have a little bit of a background in R. Um, be sure, oh, this did not get updated. Be sure you have R 3.6, right? 3.6 is what we're working with so that when we have problems, shwink, fix that bad boy. Um, uh, I'll know that it's not a, a, a version problem. Um, between 3.5 and 3.6, they did change the sample function, and that will affect some of our analyses. Not in a bad way, but in a way that would, let's make sure we're all using 3.6. Okay. And then RStudio, at least 1.1.4 for some of you that couldn't get it updated. Um, but the dev version is super amazing with 1.2, and they've moved this into a full version now. So if you can get 1.2, definitely download that. Package for the book is Arling. It's included online for downloading. Um, for to do that, you will download the file. Do not open it. So don't unzip it uh, and run this line. And it should install, barring any weird moments. Um, and if you can't get it installed, you should let me know very soon, and I will help you work through that. Um, I think most of you got it pretty good. And then we're going to use Modest for today's lecture. And for Modest to work, you often have to run this um, gene filter package for reasons I don't know, but uh, those are the required ones for today. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load those libraries, and then um, we can always interact with this in actual R, but mostly I'm going to load these libraries, and we're going to load a data set that's called LDT. And L the LDT data set, which I have... Um, a little bit here in a second, but to show you what it looks like, it, the, the row names here are words that people saw in an experiment that I'm going to explain in a second. The length column here is the number of letters in the word. Length is also pretty important for reading. Obviously, it takes us longer to read longer words. Frequency here is its prior probability, so the frequency of occurrence in English. Mean response latency here, um, they've got it labeled as reaction time, but I'm going to call it response latency and I'll cover that um, theoretical distinction in, in another lecture, um, is how long it took someone to respond to the word. Okay, so these are milliseconds. So here this is one, one, a little over one second. So this data comes from the English Lexicon Project. Um, there are several big projects we'll talk about this semester that I feel like revolutionized the, the field of, of, I hate to use the phrase big data because I don't think that means really a whole lot, but uh, in, in cognitive science, um, using uh, these normed databases became important. They're kind of like corpora like that are structured so we know what's going on. Um, much like the brown corpus, which is a really famous uh, frequency corpus. Uh, these couple of projects we're going to talk about really allowed researchers to do a lot more of these kind of modeling questions. So ELP, or the English Lexicon Project, um, really had people um, doing very basic tasks. So a, the person would come into the research lab and they would show them words on a screen, and they either had to say, yes, this is a word, or no, this is not. This is a very simple task called a lexical decision task. Um, and they're just like typing with the keyboard. So they're like hooked up to the keyboard, and they're just like going like, 
word, not word, word, not word. It's really simple. Um, the other version of the task is where they have to read the word aloud. So they would say something like crutch, efflorescent, which is a very strange word, but um, marveled, midmost. Um, and that data is all freely available online from WashU, Washington University, it's in St. Louis's um, website. Okay. And this sounds kind of like, okay, we have how long people can read words. Well, that's really interesting because then now I can look at readability statistics for my web page. I can think about um, the human attention span and how long it would take them to read something. I can use it as a, a, a data screener. So do you, how do you know your employees read their um, uh, their corporate training, right? So you know how long it should they should have spent on the page. And if they spent less than that, that's bad. So some applied examples there. Um, length is the length of the word. We covered that. Response latency is how long it took them to say yes a word, no not a word. Uh, so what can I do with that? Well, I can calculate um, using the summary function. I can calculate the minimum, so the, the fastest score or the, the shortest words. The first quartile, which is the 25% mark in the data. The median, which is the 50% mark in the data. The third quartile, 75% or the max. So we can break the data into fours or the mean, which is the average score. Uh, using MLV, which is most likely value, which is the mode from the mode S package. There's a way to calculate this using tables as well if that strikes your fancy, but I, MLV is a really easy function. Um, standard deviation is from base R, so that's the deviation. How much on average do the scores vary? And let's see what those are. So let's look at the length. Okay. So of the words that they picked for ELP, they didn't do all of English, 40,000 words. There are a lot of words, but obviously English is hundreds of thousands of words, so they picked, picked a lot of them. Minimum word length is three characters, so A and N are clearly not in the data set. <clears throat> Maximum word length is 15 characters, it's pretty long, but the median word length, so the, the, most, the, the middle of the data is about eight characters. Okay. You can see that the distribution is probably pretty normal, because the median and the mean are, are the same. Okay. So most of English is about eight character words. The mode is actually either eight or 10 characters in this data set. And the standard deviation, the variance around eight characters is about two and a half. So the large majority of the data ranges from six to 10. Okay. But you can also see here in the quartile. Yes, so for Arling, um, I can also go over this at the end here when we're done. You will have to install it using this install.packages. The package is on Moodle. Okay. It is not um, in CRAN. All right. Well, let's visualize um, response latency. So I'm going to switch over to response latency. Um, and what we can do is uh, this par option just creates a, a three picture graph. So it's kind of making a, um, a parameter for our graphs uh, where there's one row and three columns, it, just to put them all together on the same page. The histogram function allows me to create a histogram, mostly of continuous data. So notice here, we're only talking about continuous data. We'll switch in a minute to categorical data. And I'm just gonna give you some labels. If you love ggplot, go nuts. Okay. I did most of these in base R because they're pretty quick um, and we're not presenting these on any kind of website. Um, but if you want to do this in ggplot, have at. Okay. So um, there's more than one way to, to get the answers here. Um, so we can plot using the density function. And this creates the, the nice pretty histogram that um, this one's going to create a bar chart. This one's going to create the line graph. The QQNorm function calculates um, the 
uh, data as uh, applied to our normal graph. It creates a sort of this line graph. It tells us a little bit about linearity and also tells us about normality. So um, I usually use it for linearity because if the dots aren't line up on the line, the data is fairly linear. Um, because a histogram told me a lot about normality, but this is three different ways to think about the visualization of the data. So let's look at the results here. So the data is actually pretty normal. There's a small amount of skew. Remember that skew is the tail of the distribution. So this is a positive skew. Um, but in general, it's pretty normal. Where response latencies look like they average between seven and eight hundred. So in general, it takes about seven or eight hundred milliseconds, almost a whole second, to respond to a word. I can see that here if you like the density plot a little better. And then um, the QQ plot here tells me that this is pretty normal, except for that the ends. So we're um, when the dots line up on the line, this implies normality and linearity. So we'll use these more later when we are talking about how to test our assumptions for regression. So the data appears that there's just a touch of skew, just a little bit non-normal, and some outliers. So I can use box plot to view those outliers. Um, which of these words are kind of taking a long time to read? And maybe should we avoid them? Um, and we can also use z-scores. So if I run a summary of the response latencies, I can see that the, um, anytime the median and the mean are close together, this implies a pretty normal distribution. Um, they're pretty close, right? 800 milliseconds. But I clearly have some, some long response latencies. A second and a half is a long time in cognitive processing land. Okay? And then some pretty short ones, so about half a second. So let me use the uh, scale function. The scale function creates a z-score. Remember, z-score is a normalized score where the average is zero, and the scores represent how far away from average they are. So z-score one means you're one standard deviation away from the average. I just absolutely valued them so I could see too slow or too fast. And three is a normal cutoff. The book uses 2.5, but I would argue that uh, language is wonky. And most people will use three uh, as, a, as a standard deviation in which these are very far away from, from average. Um, this is theoretical differences here, but the three here represents data that's um, less than 0.1%. So we can see that the, the two words that fall into this category, unless it ran off the screen, which it might have, uh, desert spoon or dessert spoon, rather, for the accent in the right place, it's a syllable problem. Right? Uh, but I don't think that's one word, but in the ELP data, it's one word. So that's a little weird, and that's probably what, what happened, is in the study, the participants were like, is that one? what is that word? Right? Um, and then diacritical, which is a word that I would like never use in my life, except in this lecture, so that's probably uh, its long response latency is because People are trying to decide, is that literally a word or not? Okay, then it is. I would say that most freshmen who were in the study, so college freshmen, <laughs> didn't know if that was a word or not. Okay. Now, if I create a box plot, um, I can also see there's three points that we might consider. Um, so here's the median, right, our um, interquartile range. And so these are one and a half times the interquartile range, if I remember what box plot's doing correctly. Um, and that tends to also co correspond pretty nicely to three z scores. So um, we've just got one more than we thought we had. So I could lower my z score to figure out what that is. Or sometimes uh, it's not the box plot function, but there's another one that allows you to like click on it and um, label it. But the box plot shows me that the data is pretty, pretty much from 600 to 1200, a couple of little outliers. And that leads me into, the, to me, the most interesting piece of this, which is Zipf's Law. Okay, so Zipf's Law is the idea that word frequency, so now we're going to switch and talk about frequency, also continuous variable, is inversely related to its rank. Okay. So what that means is that the first 
word, the most frequent word, like the, okay, is twice as likely as the second most frequent word, three times as likely as the third most frequent word, etc. So if I take the second word, it's twice as likely as the, the next word, third word, etc. So it creates this nice power curve um, where words are extremely frequent and then they tail off. So the frequency is inversely related to its index, okay? meaning that the most frequent words, number one, all right, in our rank, um, are twice as likely as the next one, then the next one, then the next one. Okay. So to see this in the data, what I'm going to do is sort in a decreasing order, meaning I've got most frequent to least frequent. I'll just plot that. And to, it went on the homework, it asks you, does this follow Ziff's law? You just need to see this. This is called a power curve, okay? where um, the frequency is very high and then drops off and eventually levels out. So English follows Ziff's law. Well, pretty much every language follows Ziff's law, um, but some data sets don't. So we always we kind of want to see if our data is following Ziff's law or not. Let's switch gears. That's continuous. So I can calculate the mean, the mode, the standard deviation, the so quartiles. I can make some cute pictures, so histograms, um, density plots, box plots, or continuous data. So we're going to use those pieces throughout the semester. Language is often not a continuous data problem, though. It's usually actually a categorical data problem, and that's where really we got, got stuck in our analyses. So what do I have to do differently? if the data is categorical. So I'm going to switch data sets here and use a sentence data set we'll use a couple times. So each sentence was coded to be transitive, intransitive, or diatransitive. And then the subject of the sentence was either human or abstract. Um, so let me tell you what those are. So intransitive sentences are ones where there is a subject and the verb requires no object. So he sneezed does not require any kind of direct object, you can end the sentence there and it makes sense. Okay. Transitive sentences require one object, the cat bit. If you just said the cat bit, they'd be like, bit who? Bit what? what? What's happening? So this requires a direct object. Ditransitive, as in two transitive, requires two objects. These are things like gave and um, have can fit in this category too. So he gave Mary, $10. So he gave what? $10 to whom? Mary. So this is when you have a, a what and a to whom, usually. And so what, I mean, this is 20 sentences, so this is not a good representation of language. But if I look at my data set, it appears that diatransitive verbs are not very frequent. Okay? They're kind of the lesser of the data. And intransitive verbs are way more frequent, and transitive verbs are also equally frequent. And this is true of English, right? Most verbs are actually transitive, followed closely by intransitive, right? And ditransitive verbs are not very frequent at all. So to present that data, I might create a prop table, a proportions table. And so I take um, uh, the table function, which just is what this is, right? The summary function calculates a table. And then I run it through prop table. So the prop table argument requires a pre-processed frequency table. Now this is simple math, but now I can see proportionate wise how much everything is. This is more useful on larger data sets. I can make a pie chart. So you can do this in ggplot too, although I think there was a big argument I remember a couple summers ago about how one shouldn't be able to because uh, the creator of ggplot hates pie tables, um, but they have their moments, right? They're useful every once in a while. Uh, so you can also do this in ggplot. So pie here, I'm going to put in my, not my proportions, but my actual um, frequency numbers. And then I am labeling it. I'm coloring it. You can let it do its own wild colors. And then the names are the names from the um, table. 
and the proportions from the table. So I just multiply them times 100 to get the proportions here instead of the like 10 and 8. So now I can tell that the intransitive one makes up 50% of the data, transitive ones make up 40%, and ditransitive is a small 10%. So that's a pretty easy visual of like, it's real clear which ones are more popular than others. Um, so I want to I wanna use an example that I'm going to use later in the semester, but we're going to talk about um, color terminology. So Berlin K's theory on color is that there is this, there's this that languages fall into one of these categories and there's a progression that you see as a language gets older um, or more lexically, lexi lexically diverse um, they they fall into these categories so read from left to right here so the most basic color terminology that a language can have is white and black okay. things are dark or they're light and then languages tend to add various shades of red followed by green and yellow, followed by blues, browns, and then the diversification of purple, pink, orange, and gray. So we're going to come back to this theory at the end of the semester. Um, but the idea is that there are these universal color rules that we can see in languages. So if I pull some data, some interesting data here from COCA, we'll use COCA a couple of times. It's the Corpus of Contemporary American English. And I just look at how many times do people use these color terms? And are they equally frequent across different types of language? Okay. Um, so we have uh, spoken language, fiction, academic language, and press. This is like the news. This data set is ColReg for color register. And then we have all of the different colors. So there's, there's more on here that map onto Berlin K. If I ask the question, are these equal across categories? Um, the issue here is that corpus size matters. So the spoken column does not have as, is not um, quite as large numbers wise as the press column. And so I have to even out the fact that there are different numbers of, of examples in each of these um, data sets. And so corpus size is really an uh, important consideration. So what we're going to do is calculate a deviation on proportions. It's kind of like standard deviation for proportions, but not quite because the standard deviation assumes some, some normality and some continuity in the data um, and assumes a scale variable. We don't have that, right? Proportions are not scale. <laughs> so we're, we're basically working with frequency counts. So this um, statistic is sort of a measure of spread. Uh, so it's similar to standard deviation, but not quite. And so the first thing here is the size of the corpus for each of the pieces here. So it's the size of the spoken corpus. This is literally the number of words in this um, fiction, academic, and press. Okay. So here's the size for each of these corpor corpora. Uh, this little function you'll just want to run. So when you... Um, when you're doing your homework, just cut and paste this function in there. Okay, uh, I'm giving it to you. Please use it. Okay. But what it does is it calculates the deviation proportion. It's a sum of the um, absolute values of the proportions in the data minus the um, overall uh, frequency counts that one might expect. And that is divided by the standard error for proportions. So this is very similar to standard deviation, which is the sum of the deviations, right, from the mean. Here now we have a sum of the deviations from the totals divided by a measure of standard, uh, of a measure of variance, not standard error, sorry, um, which is calculated pretty differently for categorical data. So it's uh, 1 minus the minimum of the expected counts. And so what that returns is a value that um, if it's close to 0, that indicates that there is no differences 
um, in the spread of the data. So let me, uh, let me show you. Values close to one indicate that there's a there is there are differences. So let me back up because I think this is easier. Okay. If I look at black here, and um, the question after I normalize for frequency size is, are these all the same proportions or not? Okay. So if the value is zero, this is like a standard deviation. If the standard deviation is zero, there's no differences. There's no variance. Okay. So values close to zero mean that there is an equal spread of the data across all of these because there's no variance. They all have the same pr proportion. Values closer to one indicate that, that one of these is favored. Okay. There is a spread of the variance. Some of them are more popular than others. That's the way I think about it. So if we calculate this for black, okay, so after I ran my function, I put in just the row for black, and then the second argument, so here, observed count is the, the count of the data, the actual data. Expected count is the, the frequency, the total frequency of words. We see that black is actually pretty evenly spread. Okay. Um, this value is closer to zero. There's no cutoff score here. It's not like if it's 0.25, it's, it's different from zero. There's just a... Um, uh, a continuous interpretation of this. Okay. So um, black is fairly closer closer to zero than gray, for example. Um, and that implies that even though the literal numbers here look pretty different, once I control for corpus size, they're, uh, black is pretty even across the, the, the register is what it's called, the different corpuses. Okay. Um, However, gray is not. There's a bigger spread. One of these is favored over the others. So if I back up to Berlin K, that does that result uh, support Berlin K? Okay. So if the argument here is that languages start at white and black. So we should see that across different um, samples of language data, black should be pretty evenly pervasive, right? It is represented across all of these different um, sample sets. Gray, however, is something that gets added later, uh, more diversified, uh, and so it should be probably represented differently across sample sets, and that's what we see. So we see that um, black is pretty even, it's close to the, 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 the Spread is close to zero, meaning they're pretty even, uh, and gray is more biased towards one or the other. And so that's, that supports Berlin K's theory. And you can play with this and change it to orange and to purple and to blue and see how they, how they vary. So a summary. I will end each lecture with a summary. What did we learn today? So we talked a lot about just kind of um, giving you a good foundation for the course. So what is human language and what are we going to do this semester? Um, a history of analyzing human language. In statistics terms, we learned how to calculate some very simple statistics for continuous and categorical data. Mostly for categorical data, it's simple. So proportions tables, but also spread. Um, and then we added some simple graphs for visualizing data. So a big component of this semester will be data viz because um, it's like you can't escape it, right? <laughs> most, most analyses are best served with a picture, right, rather than a bunch of numbers. Okay. Next up, what we'll do next week is linear regression. Uh, and so kind of something you hopefully have had at least once um, and really talk a lot more about frequency and response latency. So we'll go back and use that LDT data set again.